Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. Dr. Lee Warren here with you, and it is Mind Change Monday, one of my favorite days of the week. We're going to change your mind about one thing. We're going to talk about attention today. Attention. It sounds so simple. What are you paying attention to, right? But I'm telling you, I'm going to blow your mind because I've been bending my brain this morning on a number of different things about the science of attention and the types of attention that we pay and what it does to our our understanding of an encounter with the world around us, with people around us, and even with God, how we pay attention changes everything. I have a couple of shout outs this morning. I have a couple of exciting things to tell you. And we're going to get all that done. But but just this morning, I'm going to give you a little idea. It's going to be the seed of something that we're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper into because we're understanding that you can't change your life until you change your mind. And when we say that, there's way more to it than just deciding to think about one thing and not another thing. I'm going to change your mind today, and I'm going to give you a tool to think about how we pay attention and why it matters, and it might change everything for you. I've shed some tears this morning as I prepared my thoughts on this, and I'm all over the place because I'm so excited and so humbled to be able to share something with you about how our Creator designed our brains and what we can do with that information and how it can be used to really change everything. And before we can use any of that to our benefit, I have a question for you. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. Are you ready to change your life? Well, this is the place, Self Brain Surgery School. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and this is where we go deep into how we're wired take control of our thinking, and find real hope. This is where we learn to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. This is where we leave the past behind and transform our minds. This is where we start today. Are you ready? This is your podcast. This is your place. This is your time, my friend. Let's get after it. All right, let's get after it. Hey, I've been reading this incredible book. So when I talked to John Lennox the other day, Dr. John Lennox, the Oxford mathematician, I I hope you heard that episode that we released with, uh, I think it was on Thursday. Yeah, Thursday of last week. John Lennox is a mathematician from Oxford and a famous apologist for the Christian faith and writes a lot of books about science and faith and how they aren't enemies. They're actually, they're actually friends. They're actually necessary. If you want to really understand who God is, you need to understand science because it's so helpful. But John and I, when we were talking off the air, he told me about this book from Ian McGilchrist called The Matter With Things. Now, don't go buy the book. It's it's several thousand pages long. It has 300 pages of references. So this is an incredible magnum opus type of book, but it's about the brain and the mind and how we see things and how his whole premise really, going back to his previous book, The Master and His Emissary, is really about how we spend too much time thinking about the left side of the brain and not enough time understanding what the right side of the brain does. And once you understand what the two sides of the brain do, then you really start to see the world in a different way. And you start start understanding that the things that we see and think about aren't all that there is. And in fact, many times they're not a good representation of what really is. And so McGilchrist's book, I'm reading it now, and it's really sort of overwhelming to start a book of that magnitude. It's it's just ridiculously long. It has 50,500 locations in Kindle, which correlates to several thousand pages. So like I said, don't go read it yet. I'm just getting into it. But every page so far, I've been like, what in the world? It's changing my my whole thought process about just everything. And the first thing that I want to tell you about, well, first of all, let's do a couple of shout outs. Today is my mother's birthday. My mom, 81 years old today. Happy birthday, mom. Sue Warren is a godly woman. She is the woman that that basically taught me where to look for answers. Her and my dad gave me this deep, powerful grounding in the word. And my mom is a very unique individual. She's had some incredible experiences. She learned to fly a plane. She was the first woman to be licensed to fly an airplane in McCurtain County, Oklahoma, way back in the day. And she's had an incredible, diverse set of experiences in her life. And I'm so proud of her and proud to be her son. So happy birthday, Mom. I love you. And shout out to Sue Warren. She's a great human being and has a lot to do with Dr. Lee Warren that you hear every day on this podcast. So happy birthday. Secondly, 
Once in a while, we live out way outside the city limits here in North Platte, and not very many places will deliver food to us. Our pizza place, though, Pizza Hut, delivers to us. We're so grateful that we can get a pizza when we need one. So Tata and I both love pepperoni pizza. He likes black olives on his. Lisa and I like regular pepperoni pizza. And the other day, the delivery came. It's a young lady that's delivered to us several times before, and she's always very friendly, and we always say hello. But when she delivered to us this week, she said, hey, by the way, we were talking about you down at the at the Pizza Hut, and I looked you up, and I started listening to your podcast. So she's been listening to Spiritual Brain Surgery and to the Dr. Lee Warren podcast, and she's getting a lot out of it. So shout out to Alyssa and all the great folks down at the North Platte Pizza Hut. We're so grateful that you deliver out here and the great work that you do, and glad that you're listening. So a little shout out to y'all, fist bump from the whole crew out here, Tata and Lisa and me, and we're grateful for you. So. Isn't it great that we live in a society where we can have food delivered to us? It's it's really one of those creature comforts that's so great, especially when you work hard and you live out of, outside of town and it's not real easy to just jump in the car and go grab something. Wonderful to have pizza delivered to your house. It's a great blessing. So we're thankful for that. Shout out to you, Alyssa. Okay, I'm back to this idea. I told you I shed some tears this morning and I did. And here's why. the The left half of your brain and the right half of your brain, we all kind of understand that we'd have this pop culture idea that they do different things, right? We always talk about in my left brain or in my right brain, am I more mathematical, am I more artistic, am I more practical, am I more whimsical? And we have these ideas. And what's happened is the society has sort of taken a very complex thing and tried to make it palatable and understandable in an easy way. And as most things, when we try to simplify something, we turn it into something that's just a taste of what it really is, right? And I just want to I want to point out to you that when you think you know something, your ability to communicate what you know with other people sort of dumbs down what it is that you actually know. Now, it's not the same thing as math. You get on a chalkboard and you write out an equation and you can communicate almost perfectly what that means. Two plus two equals four. And the student can see on the on the chalkboard and you can both be saying and completely knowing what that means. That the two plus two equals four, right? But try to describe. Well, let me give you an example. Saturday morning when the sun started coming up, the, the migration of multiple bird species is in full effect here in western Nebraska. We have an incredible viewpoint out here on Moon River Ranch. We got the river, we got cornfields nearby, we got hay fields, and the, all the birds come and land in our river, in our backyard, and our literally in the front yard on every tree branch. Every piece of ground around us was covered with some type of bird. The robins are here. They get here skinny. They leave here fat. The starlings and the red-winged blackbirds and the Canadian geese, thousands and thousands and thousands of Canadian geese. And then we saw the snow geese coming in. And then we saw in our in right off the back porch two great horned owls. These are birds with five-foot wingspans, you know, 20 feet away from our back door. We saw two bald eagles that morning. We saw two golden eagles that morning. We found the nest from our spotting scope where the golden eagles have put up a nest. We saw all of this in the span of about 30 minutes. And then the starlings started coming by. And there's a black cloud of starlings so thick that you can't see the sunrise behind them that goes on for about 40 minutes. Okay, just on and on and on. And then the sun's rising in a big red ball. And it was a full moon the night before. And as I shared with the newsletter subscribers, and if you're not getting the newsletter, by the way, you're missing out. We we do some good work on the newsletter. It's read everywhere in the world every Sunday. And I've been writing that every Sunday since 2014. And you can sign up for free at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. There's also paid options. The paid subscribers get extra stuff, more newsletters, more podcasts, archived content that's older than 60 days. All of that stuff is for the paid subscribers because they help us pay for this, the software and the microphones and the mixers and the website hosting and all the stuff that it takes. It's cost me a couple of thousand dollars a month to do this work. 
not counting my time. So the paid subscribers have said, hey, we want to help you share this to the world. We want to help you get it out there. And there's options for those folks. But if you're not getting the newsletter, yesterday I posted a picture of the full moon that I took through. I've got a camera that can zoom way up on the moon. You can see the craters and everything on the detail on the moon. And right as I snapped it, a goose flew by. So you've got this incredible picture of a, the shadow of a goose in front of the full moon. And that's the kind of thing that we get to see out here on Moon River. And I said all that to say this, imagine if I tried to describe to you what it felt like to see all of those birds, the owls and the eagles and the hawks and the starlings and the sound that they make when they fly by and when a whole group of starlings switches directions all at the same time. They have some kind of electromagnetic signaling that they do this thing called murmuration and they, they move like one of those balls of fish in the ocean that you've seen on blue planet or they just they, it's incredible imagine if i tried to describe that to you like i've been doing for the last few minutes whatever words that i choose using the left hemisphere of my brain to describe something that i saw with my eyes and took in with all of my senses when i try to describe that to you you're going to see a picture of it in your mind a, a slice of it right but that picture that you see will never be exactly what it was that I saw. Or even Lisa standing a few feet to my left and Tata standing a few feet to my right. We all saw the same set of information, but we all perceived it in somewhat different ways. And so if we even try to describe it to each other, we're, we're, we're narrowing down the experience of what we talked about, what we saw by the words that we choose to communicate them, right? So when I tell you what it's like to see two golden eagles building a nest and one of them carrying a mouse into the nest and I can see that through the scope and I, I can tell you what that looked like to me and what it felt like to me and what the sunlight on the feathers of the golden eagle as it flew by, what that was like. But you're going to get a picture of it that's just a, a little bit of information that allows you to sort of picture that in your mind and be, wow, wow, that's cool. That'd be really neat to see that. Right, But you don't have the same type of emotional reaction that I have to it because you did not see it. Right, So I'm just teeing this up for you. This is gonna, in the coming months, we're going to go deeper and deeper. And I'm writing this book on self-brain surgery. I'm trying to use all this information to help you understand the power and the necessity of changing your mind so you can change your life and you can really live. So we got an email last week from a woman who listened to my episode on the neurobiology of suffering. She wrote in and talked about how her husband had committed suicide because of chronic back pain and the hopelessness that he felt because nobody could solve the problem for him. And she said, if you, if my husband had been able to hear that episode and understand how neuroplasticity can, can actually create pain in your spinal cord that goes to your brain to tell you that you're hurting when you're actually not hurting, and you can understand that cognitive behavioral therapy can help unwind some of that neuroplastic change and help you deal with chronic pain. If, if my husband had heard that, I think he might still be alive. And that's, that's devastating to know that a little bit of information might have changed the arc of someone's life, might have even saved their life. That's why I'm doing this work, okay? Because I want you to know that how you attend to things, the attention that you pay to things on a quantum level, at, at the level of the molecules in that thing, how you attend to something influences and changes what that thing becomes. Now that sounds crazy, right? Because you say, well, I look down on my desk at the cup of coffee there and it's just a cup of coffee. Well, that's true, okay? It's just a cup of coffee. But I'm telling you, if you pay attention to that cup of coffee in a particular way, it can become more than just a cup of coffee. Let me explain. And here's the, the neuroscience rule that we're going to have. I'm trying to figure out how to lay this out because we have the Ten Commandments of Cell Brain Surgery, and we're going to evolve those a little bit. I got an email yesterday. Somebody asked, again, where are these all in one place? Well, there's several episodes where we did all of them. There's one of the newsletters where we did all of them, and I'm gonna, I'll give you an episode this week with a re-presentation of the Ten Commandments. We'll try to do that every few months, and as they evolve, we'll eventually get them where they're unchanging and they're laid out, and, and they're going to be in the book. So once I put them in the book, I can't... <laughs> I can't modify them anymore. So I'm trying to just really put them down in a way that, that you will be able to benefit from. But one of the corollaries out of making the Ten Commandments is there's a bunch of facts that I've distilled and learned from neuroscience and learned from Scripture and the smashing together of them 
that that things that just are and they're clearly true but they're not commandments. They're just things that you need to know. And one of those is we always talk about what you're doing, you're getting better at, okay? You, and what that means is when you do something, you look at the cup of coffee, your brain starts to make synapses of all the things that you think about and all the things that you do when you see that cup of coffee become more automated so they become less consciously dry, draining on your resources. So as I'm talking to you, I'll sometimes reach out and get my cup of coffee and take a sip and put it back down and never actually think about the fact that I did that. Right when you're driving to work, after you learn the route, then before long you're you're adjusting your radio. You're thinking about what you're going to talk about at work. You're not thinking about the turns and the navigation and the movements that you make, the stoplights and all the things that you do. You got to slow down for the school zone and all that. You don't think about that actively after you've automated the process of driving to work because your brain needs to use that energy for something else, right? So you're looking out for kids in the crosswalk, but you're not thinking about the right turn that you got to make because you, you just don't have to think about it anymore because what you're doing, you're getting better at. That's one of those facts. Well, here's another one. What you observe or how you attend, let's use the word attend. And when I say paying attention, the attention, the process of paying attention is called attending. So attending to something is giving it your mental energy and, and paying attention to it, okay? So what you observe or attend becomes more real or true over time depending on your perspective on it. Okay, that's we call that the quantum Zeno effect. And in quantum physics, it means when you look at it, when you observe a system, the system becomes more and more true of how you observe it over time. And that's a deep, weird sounding thing, but it's just true. Just take it from me right now as a truth. And we've talked about it before and we'll talk about it again. And if you want to go deeper into it, read The Mind and the Brain by Jeffrey Schwartz. And you'll understand it on a deeper level. But from a quantum perspective, what you attend, how you attend to something becomes makes it more true over time. So what you observe or attend becomes more real or true over time. Okay? So let's talk about the cup of coffee again. I look at this. It's a cup of coffee. It's in a white Yeti that Lisa got me. It keeps it warm. And it's just a cup of coffee. It's But, okay, that's one way to pay attention to it, right? Here's another way. This is a cup of black silk from Folgers Coffee Company. It's dark roast. It's got a lot of caffeine. It's warm. It warms me up. It makes me, helps me wake up in the morning. It calms me down. It gives me uh, some energy and it helps me start my day. So now I've given you two ways to attend to this cup of coffee. It's one kind of generic way. It's a cup of coffee, right? Another more specific way, it's a White Yeti filled with black silk from Folgers. Okay, now let's look at another one. Let's say that I'm a employee of the Folgers Coffee Company. Okay, well now that coffee is a product that I have sold that has helped me make my living and feed my family. Right, so now I'm, I'm paying attention to that product in a very different way. Now I've, I've got some gratitude that I have been able to sell you this cup of coffee. I'm an employee at Starbucks, and and that cup of coffee now is my the way that I earn my living. Or I'm a shareholder of Folgers, and now that, that cup of coffee is value in return for an investment that I worked hard and made. And it's, it's something that I'm using for my retirement, and I'm holding on to this idea that the more people that drink that cup of coffee, the better and more comfortable my retirement might be someday. Right? See, I'm paying attention to the same thing in a variety of different ways. Now, I'm a farmer in Colombia, and that cup of coffee represents my life's work and my family's land. And I, when I see it, I think about my grandfather on his knees, and he's planting and harvesting and, and pruning and doing that hard work of growing those coffee beans up in the mountains. And that company has come along and purchased our beans and renewed their lease for our land and they're feeding our children and that produces the income that we used to build the school and build the clinic in our village and and this cup of coffee represents livelihood and it represents family and it represents memory and it represents you know history for me and so now what i'm doing is i'm paying attention in different ways and in every one of those different ways that I pay attention to this cup of coffee, it has an entirely different reality. And the more I think about it along that particular line, the more real and true that thing come, becomes in my life. Does that make sense to you? Okay, now just put that aside for a second. Let's talk about a different kind of attention. There's sort of two ideas 
with intention. The first is the brain is asymmetrical. There's two halves of the brain. They're connected by a white matter bundle in the middle called the corpus callosum. And the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have different roles and different jobs. So McGilchrist says, the brain is asymmetrical in almost everything that could be measured at many levels in both its structure and function. The two sides of the brain are not the same. Why? We'll get to that. The power of the brain exists only through making connections between neurons. So we talk about synapses all the time. And the whole game with neuroplasticity is that your brain can create new synapses between neurons and new networks between neurons influenced by the things that you think about, feel, experience, navigate, and overcome. Okay, those those synapses are the whole game with the brain. If you didn't have synaptic connections, it would basically be only as good as the neurons and initial connections that were in it when it was created or evolved, if you want to say it that way, if you're one of those folks that thinks we came from the cosmic goo, okay? So if your brain didn't have the ability to change its connections, it would be like one of those old handheld video games that that can't be programmed. It's just, it is what it is. It's got the program in it. You can't change it. And it's only good for what it was initially made, how it was initially made for one purpose. But your brain has the ability to make connections, and that's what makes it special. And you can change those connections by changing how you think. And that's why it's so important to learn how to change your mind under your control because it will change outside of your control if you don't direct that process, right? If you don't shape your brain, it'll be shaped for you because that process of neuroplasticity is happening all the time whether you attend to it or not. And the principal connection between the left and the right is the corpus callosum. And that has a mostly inhibitory function. In other words, the corpus callosum mostly calms down crosstalk between the two hemispheres. Okay. We'll get to more about that in coming months. So let's talk about attention for just a second. If you're, McGilchrist gives this example, and it's a good one. If you're a bird, you've got a problem. You've got to eat and survive without being eaten. We see it out here on the river all the time. The bald eagle will jump down and kill a duck or snipe, you know, swoop down and take out a goose. And the goose was just trying to survive and the eagle got him because he wasn't paying enough attention. So the goose, the bird, has a job all the time of surviving without being without being killed, okay? So there's sort of two ways it has to pay attention, and you do too. There's one that's this narrow beam, precisely focused type of attention. And a good example McGilchrist gives us is the bird has to be able to look down at the ground and see one seed amidst all these rocks and pebbles and grass blades on the ground. The bird has to be able to focus in and see that seed and swoop down and fly precisely to it and grab that seed and fly away and eat and survive without being killed. Okay. So it has to be able to use a narrow laser focus and see something clearly amidst all this other information that's there. But at the same time, it has to have a very different type of attention, and that's this broad, open, sustained, vigilant attention to everything around it. So it's got to be able to focus on that seed, but also be able to see threats coming, not fly into the window, not get itself killed by something in the neighborhood, right? So at the very same time, two types of attention happening, one very precise and focused, one very open and broad and vigilant. And that's what's happening with the two sides of your brain. The Germans have two words for knowledge. There's two words for knowledge. One is kennen, K-E-N-N-E-N, and the other one is wissen, W-I-S-S-E-N, kennen and wissen. And they're different, and they're important. It's important to know the difference. English, unfortunately, we, we use the word know, and we, we have a bunch of different things that that can mean, and there's a lot of nuance in it. But when we say know, we could either mean that we know a particular fact or that we can know the experience of something or have a relationship with someone or, or have a big, large set of things that we are familiar with about that thing or that person. And this is going to come into play again. We're going to have an episode about this knowledge, this type of knowledge you get from left and right brain. And it's, it's, it's about how we know God and how we know truth and how we know and experience other people. Okay. So when the German says kennen, it means 
that I that I know I'm familiar with. I I understand the ways of I, I'm I'm aware of and around this person or this thing enough that I have a knowledge a working knowledge of the nuances and the depth of it. And Vissen is this. I know a fact. Okay, the bird says there's a seed on the ground down there. I know that that's Vissen, but the bird also can say. I'm in a big, wide world, and there's a lot of things out here, and there's all kinds of different experiences and sights and sounds, and I need to be aware of all of them at the same time if I want to stay alive. That's Kenan. That's this this I know, I'm familiar with, I understand. There's a lot more happening here than just that seed on the ground down there, that fact that there's a thing I can particularly focus on, okay? So set that knowledge deal aside for a minute, and let's get back to attention. We're going to wrap this up today. I'm telling you, this is tip of the iceberg kind of stuff, but it's incredibly important. And I told you a while ago that I shed some tears this morning, and here's what it is, okay? Understanding that there is more than one way to attend to something, and that understanding that the way that you attend to something on a quantum level makes it more and more true. How you perceive it becomes more and more true about what it is over time, okay? If you think... Let's bring it down to brass tacks, Brent. If you think that the trauma or the tragedy or the massive thing or the hardship or the why is my whole life so hard thing is all that it is, that your whole experience is about the thing that happened to you or that that thing that happened is only one thing, it's only tragedy, it's only trauma, it's only this massive wound in my heart that seems like it'll never get better, that's what's going to become true in your life. Okay, and what I want to give you today is just this little idea, okay, this this little idea that's actually a nuclear bomb's worth of energy to transform your thinking and transform your life and redeem your hope and plant your feet solidly back on the ground again of a life that can look like something that might even involve joy and abundance again is this, even if you can't shift your attention right now to a different reality, okay? Your son's been stabbed to death. Your husband has glioblastoma. Your your boy drowned in the lake. Your husband committed suicide. Even if that's all you can see right now, it's critically important for you to be able to acknowledge at least to yourself that there's more than one level of attention that could be paid to that thing. And that sometime as you progress through grief, Sometime in the future, if it's not right now, there will come a time when you're able to contemplate some of those other ways in which you could pay attention to this thing. The difference between, we talk about the crashers and the climbers and the dippers and the untouchables in my book, Hope is the First Dose, the different ways that people respond to trauma and the different ways that we progress through our life after we face these massive things. And I think I'm just starting to to sort of be able to articulate this idea. But I think that what might separate those different responses is the ability that we have to attend differently to things at different times, okay? This cup of coffee right now is a cup of coffee that's waking me up. But it could also be all those other things that we talked about. And all of those things are equally true about this cup of coffee at the very same time. The seed on the ground is food for the bird to help it survive. But if it only uses that narrow beam of attention, it won't see the eagle coming that will kill him. You've got to be able to shift and be aware of more than one type of attention at the same time. And here's what I want to give you today as we part. If you can see that this shattered world that you have after this massive thing has happened, could also be, at the same time and equally true, could also be God tilling up the soil of your heart to plant something there that at some point in the future, to the watering of your tears, will grow a crop that will change the world for you or your family. If you can see that, even if you can't feel it or process it or know it, if you can just trust God enough to know that when he says, I am with you, and I'm close to you when you're brokenhearted, and I'm doing things on your behalf, and I'm working things out for your good, if you can find that all those promises, if you can just acknowledge that, yes, God's promises are true, I can't feel them right now, I can't think about them right now, I can't pay attention to them right now, but I know they're there, 
And I know that there's a crack in the door with a little light down there. And someday I'm going to be able to shift my attention and think about the fact that maybe there's something being planted in me right now that will result in something good. I can tell you from my experience 11 years later, I wasn't thinking about starting a podcast and writing books and helping somebody I've never met before maybe not commit suicide when my son died. I was thinking about how painful it was that my son died and how hard how hard that was and where was God in that moment. And that's what I was thinking of, okay? But at some point through the prehab that I had put in my heart before and the self-brain surgery that I learned how to do with Lisa and I shifting our focus and our attention to other things and the community we built and the rehab that we went through and the hard work of wellness that we have put on for 11 years now and the, and the coming alongside us of our great physician to help try to heal us. We've been able to shift our focus and see, yes, when our hearts were ripped open, he was in fact planting some things there. Yes, in fact, that loss was more than one thing. Yes, Mitch's life didn't end that day. Actually, it helps today. It's serving and helping people and providing. He, his story is helping people in real time throughout the world 11 years later. I can shift my attention and I can see that God was faithful and he was there. And so if you can then learn to, instead of having to wait 11 years to see that other things can be true, if you can just learn this little toolkit, this little bit of self-brain surgery, this little mind shift that all the time I'm engaging more than one type of attention. And you can start to then just allow some hope to be planted there in that moment. And you can shift from this listen where I know a fact and I'm in suffering right now to this Kenan idea that I know that my Redeemer lives. And even in this moment when things are hurting, and even when I can't pay enough attention to it, I know that there's more to this story that I'm able to articulate right now. And that little bit of mind shift will give you the hope to keep moving forward or to at least know that you'll be able to move forward again at some point, my friend. We have to shift our attention. There's two halves of your brain. And we've told one story in our society for a long time that the left side is the one that we need to be paying attention to. But I'm telling you, the right side has its role and its place and it's paying attention so you don't get killed by everything that comes along and every massive thing that happens because you can shift your attention to a broader perspective and you can see that there's more to this story than just the pain that you're feeling right now. And the good news of all of that, my friend, is that you can start today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren podcast is brought to you by my brand new book, Hope is the First Dose. It's a treatment plan for recovering from trauma, tragedy, and other massive things. It's available everywhere books are sold, and I narrated the audio books. Hey, the theme music for the show is Get Up by my friend Tommy Walker, available for free at TommyWalkerMinistries.org. They are supplying worship resources for worshipers all over the world to worship the Most High God. And if you're interested in learning Learning more, check out TommyWalkerMinistries.org. If you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, and go to my website and sign up for the newsletter, Self Brain Surgery, every Sunday since 2014, helping people in all 50 states and 60 plus countries around the world. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'll talk to you soon. Remember, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today.